Hi, welcome to Painting Lab progress report number eight. So I know there's been a two month gap since the last video on this channel and the reason for that is not laziness, I promise you. It is that what we've discovered here about drawing and painting is really game changing. And because of that, there need to be certain fundamentals in place that mean that we can bring the most benefit to the largest number of people. What I think I want to do in the videos that come in the next two or three months, because I'm not able to make content in quite the way that I could do before, just haven't got the time, is to open Painting Lab up to be more of a forum, more of a platform, as your opinions start to filter into the process. So today what I'm gonna do is show you the completion of this drawing, but also we're gonna to listen to an essay that was written by a chap called David Miller Stinchcombe. David, I hope I've said your surname right. David has been following the channel for two or three years and we've been in touch for about 18 months. And then uh, a few months ago, he sent me a wonderful essay, which really sums up all the work I've been doing with the comparator mirror. And David shares his opinion about why he thinks that's so significant. So I don't really think that there's much else I can say in this video, other than that if you feel inspired by what Dave says, then perhaps you should do what Dave did and uh, get in touch at the email address below or by going to paintinglab.com and signing up to our mailing list. And that way, as I always say, you can become directly involved in our experiment to try to revolutionize the way that we learn to draw and paint. To introduce the comparator mirror, along with a particular painting technique, was devised by Tim Jennison in response to the academic question, namely how could Vermeer paint colour, and especially value, which is the, the brightness and darkness of colour, with a fidelity that is not possible with the unaided eye. Now, as interesting as these ideas may be, this talk is not about the academic arguments connected to um, Tim's Vermeer. Rather, the purpose of this discussion is to talk about why Thomas's approach to teaching painting is so effective, as well as a little about the value of painting itself. One of the most influential education writers for me is a man called Caleb Gatenio. Gatenio originally worked with Piaget, translating Piaget's work into English and later Catenia developed a primary mathematics curriculum using concrete materials created by George Cuisinier. Catenia came to the view that the only thing that can be taught is awareness. The idea of awareness is well developed by Catenia in his writings, but briefly and simply it is conscious thought. All teachers can do is help develop ideas in the conscious mind of their students. The problem is that many activities, painting and maths among them, are to a large extent mental activities, and by their nature, mental activities are rather obscure to the observer. So the task of teaching is to work out how to expose our thoughts in a way that the student can readily understand what is going on. That is to help the student become conscious of the mental activity of the teacher. This is why teachers make use of aids, not as a permanent crutch, but as a tool to help convey our thoughts. To quote Madeleine Goutard, who worked with Gatenio, and she said, The advantage of materials such as the one proposed by George Cuisinier is that, paradoxically as it may seem, it enables children to reach an understanding of mathematical structures and frees them from the necessity to have recourse to concrete support. And so it is with the comparative mirror. Thomas's insight was that the mirror could be used as an aid to teach the art of painting. What I want to do is approximate what I'm seeing in the source photograph. I don't want to copy it exactly. Every drawing that I make anyway is a, about experimenting. 
Without the comparator mirror, the drawing would just seem to come together as if by magic. And what teachers like myself haven't been able to do until now is show you why I'm doing what I'm doing in the moment that I'm doing it. While others have treated the mirror as a curiosity, Thomas has established over many years that it can be used to teach the skills of fine art. In his videos, Thomas regularly compares the use of the mirror in teaching painting to using a calculator in teaching maths. And for me, as a maths teacher, this suggests Thomas was taught maths using the calculator aware number curriculum. Now, I won't look at the details of that program, but it was an effective teaching program. Let us be clear, neither calculators nor quizzing over rods teach maths. Rather, these are only ever tools in a program. Mirrors cannot teach you how to paint as a fine artist. Rather, the mirror is only helpful when it is part of an effective teaching program. This is the contribution of Thomas Georgeson. Before we go further, I'd like to return to the idea of learning skills and practicing skills being distinct. The mirror may make learning to paint easier, but painting is still hard work, just as it is for any artist. The goal of, of teaching, of good teaching, is to make the process of learning less painful not to make the art itself less painful. Mathematics is still hard for mathematicians. Painting is still hard for painters. How do we get there? Well, there might be some ways of making the learning process easier. But all we're aiming to do through the mirror is to make it possible for the student to converse with a trained artist as an artist, for the student to understand what the artist is talking about. Leonardo once said in one of his writings, you must be learned before you can be skilled. The skilled teacher cannot create instinctive artists who apparently paint effortlessly. Rather, the mirror simply makes it easier for, to both teach and learn the skills of an artist, potentially opening up the field of fine art to many more people than is currently available. Beside the use of the mirror, the process of learning to paint, as presented by Thomas, is completely conventional. It consists of making copies of masterworks or other images by building up the detail of the painting in a number of distinct stages. So then, how does the mirror help? The mirror allows the student to focus on learning the skills of mark making, that is, coordinating hand and eye, choosing the right brush, mixing paints on the palette, blending paints on the canvas, etc, etc. The acquisition of these skills is confirmed to both the learner and any casual observer, as a student is readily able to use the mirror to produce high fidelity copies of the masterwork. The point was that we learnt so much about brushwork and about the language of painting, and but all the conversations that you and I are having now, I had with the Scarlett. Same. Yeah, the same. Oh my gosh. Being able to rapidly acquire the technical skills of mark making, the student is then able to explore the much more important issue, the artistic issue of creating aesthetically pleasing images. Using the mirror, many of the difficulties relating to observing and comparing the developing painting with the subject are radically reduced or removed entirely. The mirror shortens the visual distance between the subject and the canvas to almost nothing. You don't have to keep your eye in that special spot and so you can actually keep both eyes open. Like there's no need for squinting or winking or any of the other weird artistic gesturing that happens when people are copying images. In using the mirror, when a teacher makes a mark on the canvas, students can readily see how that mark connects to the original image. And they have an excellent chance of understanding what the teacher is talking about as the painting progresses. One of the great frustrations as a beginner of watching a painting demonstration is about as informative as trying to learn magic by watching a magic act. Everything is visible on show to the student, but the student cannot make sense of what is going on. Now, the mirror does encourage close observation of the subject, and my own experience of um, doing cover lessons in art classes is actually this is something that students struggle to do. They often end up focusing wholly upon their painting and not really paying respect to the subject at all. The mirror encourages close observation 
of the subject. However, what the mirror does not do is to train the student in how to make observational measurements like a conventional artist. However, I've got to say, this lack becomes painfully obvious when trying to paint conventionally, and so paradoxically, the mirror helps develop an awareness of the need for these skills. Now, one important point regularly raised in Thomas's videos is that the mirror is not tracing. I have to admit I've struggled to understand why this is important. Having used the mirror, I agree it is not tracing, but what is wrong with tracing? Leonardo, Van Gogh and many, if not most, great artists have used tracing at one time or other as part of their practice. Andy Warhol even presented traced images as final artworks. Tracing may be thought of as cheating by some, but creating pleasing images through tracing is not so simple. So why the issue? And does it really matter? Well, in tracing, you paint or draw over the top of the subject. Conversely, in conventional painting, you are constantly comparing the subject and the canvas. And this is what happens when you use the mirror. In conventional painting, at times you rely on memory, and at other times you allow the hand to move unobserved while you eyeball your subject. When using the mirror, the memory required may be only a fraction of a second, as other times when the brush is unobserved. But nonetheless, there are moments of uncertainty, which for me at least, are an intrinsic part of painting. Now, what I've just mentioned is not how Tim Jennison proposed to use the mirror, but he had a different purpose in mind. He had this academic issue. Perhaps, though, these differing uses of the mirror point to one of its great potentials. Modern artists do not aim to make copies of reality. They aim to make aesthetically pleasing interpretations. Different artists do, them, do this in different ways. They make different choices. The mirror could help us see how these choices are made. Now, I wanted to finish this talk with a little about the value of learning to paint itself. Issues of creativity, self-realization, aesthetic value are often used to justify teaching art. Now, these are valuable reasons for learning to paint. But what is often not mentioned is that art requires rational, clear-headed thinking in service to our emotions. There can be little doubt that artists and musicians were central to promoting rational thinking in the 1400s creating the Renaissance and leading to the Age of Enlightenment and our modern scientific era. My own master's project was looking at optical distortions in glass. When I started to learn to draw, it came as a very pleasant surprise to learn that much of the maths I had used in my project owed its origins to the work of Renaissance painters. Even the most modest reading of Leonardo's writings on painting showed that he was working as a rational being. He was bringing science to the canvas. My own plans for the mirror, interrupted by recent world events, are to use the mirror to help students explore illusions of colour in the spirit of the writings of Joseph Albers. Albers' own work, while aesthetically motivated, was a systematic exploration of how we see colour. Artists aim to create aesthetically pleasing images, but in order to do this, rational thinking is required. Now I could carry on discussing the rational aspects of painting for a long time, but the for the most part, I'll leave that for you to investigate. Martin Kemp's The Science of Art is a great place to start such an inquiry. However, there is just one aspect of painting I would like to highlight, and that is the process of building up an image in successive stages of increasing detail. It works in much the same way as techniques I used to use as a mathematician, such as Fourier analysis or asymptotics. In essence, when you're trying to understand the real physical world, no amount of scrabbling around with fine detail can help you with the broad structure of a problem. For an engineering problem I once faced, previous attempts to address it had failed precisely because the work had used a fine detailed approach, which meant a very large and serious problem was overlooked. In the modern world, and especially with recent world events, it is all too easy to hear people in the media arguing about details, while neither side seems able to present the broad structure of the situation with any clarity or certainty. Such discussions are deeply frustrating. Painting helps to remind us that premature focus on fine detail 
often leads to poor outcomes when trying to understand the world. Any discussion about painting would seem incomplete without talking about creativity. I have to admit, I struggle to know what the word creative means anymore, as it seems to mean different things to different people. However, it is hard to see how anything that can be acquired by instruction alone can be classified as creative. At best, teachers can allow time and space for creativity by presenting tasks that encourage students to exercise their creativity. And for me, at least, this would seem to be as true in a maths lesson as it does in a painting lesson. Anyone serious about trying to understand the role of education in supporting creativity should look at the study in the book Breakpoint and Beyond. The study showed that the overwhelming majority of children who entered school were not merely capable of being creative, they were already genius level connective thinkers. Connective thinking being associated with creativity. If we value creativity then the trick is working out how to sustain this natural capacity in children. I have no doubt that art can play a part in this, but the devil is in the detail. The mere fact that a subject called painting is on the school timetable does not mean that creativity will be supported. We as individuals should recognise the responsibility we have for our own education and that of our children. If, as I do, you believe that the arts and the visual arts in particular are important, then you need to find an effective approach to learning these subjects. When it comes to learning how to paint, the approach developed by Thomas is very accessible for those of sufficient maturity, and I thoroughly recommend it. Be courageous, be curious, and be compassionate. Thank you for your time. So I hope what you've seen and what we've heard has been interesting to you today. If it has, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can also, as I said in the beginning, join our experiment by going to paintinglab.com and signing up to our mailing list. See you next time.